Hari what's up hey everyone just checking in let me see hey everybody how's it going whoo y'all we got a lot to talk about <laughs> hey everybody what's up damn yo we there's a lot to discuss. Hey everybody, what's up? Thanks so much for joining. So appreciate you. Hey everybody, how's it going? How's it going? What's up? Let's talk. <laughs> hey everyone, what's up? Um, how's it going everybody? What's up? What it do? Hey everyone. Um, all right, let's hop right into it. Let's talk about it. Um, so we had this absolutely wild infrastructure vote last night. And if you're watching TV or, you know, seeing stuff, punditry, people might be like, oh my God, like, you know, all this drama. What I try to do as much as I can with you all is that regardless of whether you agree with me, or regardless of whether you disagree with a decision or things like that, my goal is always to give you all maximum transparency and let you see what was going on in terms of the chess pieces on the board and what was actually happening behind the scenes so that you can actually think about what you would do if you were put into a similar position. Because a lot of times, there are votes that happen on the floor and you'll read in or you'll see you watch tv or you see media and the only thing that gets covered is that a vote happened and who voted for it and who voted against it and so for example uh there was an infrastructure vote last night and you will see a lot of people uh in mainstream media or punditry etc and framing this essentially as if you vote for it, you are mature and smart, magnanimous and good. And if you voted against it, you are petulant, dumb, selfish, or bad. And, you know, it, it's not to say that it's the opposite. It's not to say that that, you know, but it's to say that what happens when in the process of legislating is always more complex than that. So let's talk about what happened. Um, let's start with, and like, I've been thinking about what I was gonna talk to you guys about on this and there's so much there. So I'll probably be answering some questions um, throughout the process and it'll probably be a little ping pongy, so bear with me. Uh, but I want to talk to you about what went into it, what, what went into that and what was happening in the process. So let's start with the beginning. In the beginning, uh, we elected Joe Biden on an unprecedented, uh, you know, platform. And it was unprecedented in a lot of ways. Uh, as folks know, he was not my first choice in the primaries. Uh, he probably wasn't a lot of your all's first choice in the primaries. But we all knew the fascist threat that is in front of this country, that was in front of this country and continues to be in front of this country. And uh, what we could do is our best in that situation. And, uh, you know, I believe that the president understood, the now president, but then candidate, understood that in order for us to defeat what was happening, you know, this precipice of fascism, we needed everybody. We needed everybody. We needed affluent white suburban folks to vote. We needed poor people to vote. We needed young people. We needed communities of color. We needed cities. We needed suburbs. We needed rural areas. We need everybody, right? And in order to do that, you know, I would say that his kind of natural base was already like suited towards more moderate, more privileged, etc. Like he got, he had that. Um, he needed and also, it wasn't just, you know, 
I don't like dividing people up into like progressive and moderate and this and that because the reality is that people are really complex and we're individuals and some people may have more moderate views in some ways and have like really radical views in other areas. Um, but listen, like we start off and we have and we start off this infrastructure vote. We elect or rather we elect the president on an unprecedented infrastructure platform. Now. Earlier this year, it was really important to all of us that this infrastructure plan passes through. And there was an effort during the summer by Republicans and Joe Manchin, uh, you know, Senator Sinema, et cetera, to pull out into a separate piece of legislation, the pieces of the infrastructure plan that were quote unquote physical infrastructure bridges, roads, things like that. And they say, okay, like this is something we can get Republicans and Democrats on, like, okay, cool, go for it. Um, you know, to us, we were like, okay, if we wanna separate these like in concept, if you wanna separate them uh, in order to get Republicans on board in concept, like sure, but what we're really concerned about is that we are having a class crisis in this country. Uh, we have a crisis of wages, we have a crisis of n lack of health care, of lack of child care, of, you know, like Social Security, Medicare, like all of these things. This is also infrastructure too. And that's not like a joke. It's not, um, it's not a rhetoric. It's not any of that, right? But moreover, when it comes to infrastructure, we need to address the climate crisis. And there are folks in politics that want a win and wins are really important. And I will tell you, it's this entire time I was willing to vote for this bill if it was paired with Build Back Better. Because with this infrastructure bill, there are unprecedented climate investments, which I support. EVs, you know, public transit, et cetera. Um, there are also a lot of giveaways to the oil and gas industry. And there's a lot of um, folks that would say, had to pass, this is what we have to do, et cetera. And that's the thing, we, were, we are and continue to be willing to pass this with the Build Back Better Act. Because when we talk about the unprecedented climate investments in this infrastructure package, what people don't understand is that they have been linked, like these policies, a lot of them are almost half policies, where the other half is in Build Back Better. And so the drawdown provisions in this infrastructure plan do not get enabled or unlocked unless we pass Build Back Better. My main concern is that we may have just voted. If passing BIF alone without Build Back Better, my main concern is that we just locked in the United States to increase its climate emissions. And it's not a popular thing to say, it's something you'll get a you know, ton of attacks on mass media and all of this, but there is, are you willing to accept less than what you wanted, which frankly we do all the time. And these accusations about how we're petulant and always holding out and don't understand the big picture and all this other stuff. We are, I'm constantly taking votes where I accept less than what we wanted it is it is a part of electoral politics but what i've been very concerned about this entire time is are we going to lock in emissions increases and there will be folks and there's going to be a lot of folks saying um this doesn't do that and there's a lot of funny math around emissions. People will just count, for example, CO2 emissions and they don't count methane emissions and things like that. And I have said this in closed doors. 
I have said this to our caucus. I have said this, expressed this to our speaker. I have said this to everybody. This, I cannot vote to increase our emissions without a commitment to draw them down. And a lot of the people making these decisions aren't gonna be here in 2050 and in 2060. And we are. And so, you know, we need a commitment to draw them down. And I, you know, people wanna say like a no is a protest and immature and all this other stuff. And I first like wanna say, first and foremost, I congratulate the president. What he is doing right now is extremely difficult because we want to enact bold policy that impacts the lives of every single person in this country. The position he is in is not easy because we want him, this whole country wants him to do that in a time when our, our, our political margins are more narrow than ever before. We have one of the narrowest margins in the House in US history. We have a 50-50 Senate. Like what he, the position he is in is very, very difficult. And for him to pass such large legislation uh, in such a difficult time, you know, that is an accomplishment. And I am not here to say that the folks who supported this bill are bad. I do not speak poorly of anybody, you know, any of that. I'm not here to trash that. But this entire time we said, and I made a promise to my community, to my community, the community that has elected me. And I'm aware that I represent a lot more people than just the folks that live in my pocket of Queens and the Bronx. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, every two years, I have to go back to New York's 14th Congressional District and ask them to trust me to represent them and their interests. And all of this week, if you live in our community in New York 14, you all have been calling me. You all have been on Zooms with me. You can see, like, literally, I'll go on Zoom with a group of five constituents, you know, that represent communities that, that we advocate in Jackson Heights and in Park Chester and all over the place. And, um, and they'll say, well, like, what do you think about that? What do you think about this? And I actively consult with my community all the time. And you know, out there in, in everywhere beyond my home, you know, people may think or speculate about what motivates me or what my ambitions are and all this other stuff. And I think it's really hard to believe, but for some folks and really hard to accept for some folks because we have just been conditioned to believe that everyone who's elected is always just trying to like scramble to be somewhere else or, or do something bigger. I, you know, I'm good. I've been elected as the youngest Congresswoman in American history. It took over 200 and something years for this country to elect a woman in her twenties to Congress. We, we done started it with men in their 20s, okay? So like three, four years ago, I was a waitress in a bar. I have already accomplished more than I ever dreamed was even possible in my life. So this isn't about like that, okay? You all said, do not allow a path to citizenship to die. Do not allow paid leave to die. Do not allow childcare to die. Do not allow pre-K to die. And do not lock in increased emissions. Yesterday, the Progressive Caucus worked really hard. And I wanna hand it to Pramila Jayapal because her leadership in this has been incredible. We had, you know, there are Republican votes for this bill. 
And there were Republican votes for a reason, for a reason. And so, you know, it got to a point where we needed to make sure that we translated, if this was going to pass, we had to translate it into a commitment, into a commitment on doing things for working class people. And Pramila Jayapal secured that commitment. Um, she got a commitment from House moderates. Throughout this day and throughout this process, you know, people say, I would argue that within our caucus, one of the issues that we have had is trust. And trust is not built in the big moments. Trust is built in the little moments. Trust is built in process. And I think one of the issues that we had yesterday, for example, is um, we had a commitment that we we're going to vote on the rule to allow BBB to proceed first. That there was going to be a statement because here's the issue. We were ready to vote on Build Back Better this week. We were ready to vote on both of them this week, like Monday and Tuesday. We were ready to vote on both of them and send them both out. And then at the very last minute, there was a group of six people saying, now all of a sudden we need a CBO score, a, a Congressional Budget Office score. Uh, the problem with that is that they're saying we need this for fiscal responsibility. This is for child care, universal pre-K, all of this other stuff. And so we want to wait on this. We're ready to vote for both. We want to wait on this. We want to send, we want a CBO score on this. And while we wait for that, by the way, we want to vote on this bill right now that we know increases the deficit. I want you all to know this is not something that's important to me, but for someone who claims that if you're claiming you don't want to allow Build Back Better to proceed unless you can get certainty on the deficit, to demand that you have a deficit increase uh, bill at the same time, it doesn't add up. It's weird. Something weird was going on. And after cuts to so many of these things, we're concerned. We're super concerned. And so, you know, we have this problem and I'm really scared that if we don't deliver this transform transformative change for people, you know, we're gonna need everybody again. And yes, you know, if your main concern right now, if life is okay for you and you're concerned about winning over swing voters, like we do need to win over swing voters. It's a huge concern. We also need to turn out our base. And um, I think what I think is really important, again, and I congratulate uh, the president on getting this passed, is that if there was a promise that was kept or if there is a check that is being written, it needs to be cashed. And there need to be people that are willing to hold institutions accountable for the promises they make. And, um, you know, what I was seeing yesterday, even in procedures, the folks that were asking us to trust them two weeks from now made a promise, even on little things. We were supposed to vote on a rule to allow Build Back Better to proceed first. And then we were gonna vote on the bipartisan bill. And then we were gonna get these statement and these promises. And then that was the agreement. And then literally the vote was called and the rule didn't go first. There were so many aspects to this that were concerning to me. And I will be the first to tell you that no one wants to be proven wrong more than me. I really wanna be wrong. I really want the Build Back Better Act to be put up in two weeks without cuts, without any more cuts than so much of what has been cut as it is. And I want it to be signed into law. What I saw happening yesterday was shaking my confidence 
in our in in whether that was going to happen and in my community the message that you all were sending to me was very clear was to do everything you can to make sure that we deliver this and you know we're all positioned politically in difficult hands because we live in such a diverse country. If you're in the center, you feel like the left is always attacking you and you can't win. If you're on the left, and but you know, moderates will generally always be, most of the time be quite understanding, etc. If you're on the left, you are hit <laughs> also on your left for the compromises you make. And from moderates from calling you saying you're unreasonable, you know, this, that, and the other, you're unthoughtful, et cetera. Um, and what I think is really important is that I think that my vote yesterday created the space to hold this institution accountable. Um, I want this check that was written to be cashed. And what was happening this week with the Build Back Better Act even though the language is out, it was locked in, oil and gas industries have been trying to cut the methane provisions in the Build Back Better Act. And, you know, I wanna be wrong. I really, 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 really wanna be wrong. I do. I wanna be wrong so bad. Um, I want us to pass universal pre-K. I want us to pass the climate drawdown provisions. I want us to pass all these things so bad two weeks from now. Um, I do not understand if we were ready to vote on both of these on Monday, why all of a sudden they were decoupled when industry and lobbyists and everything have been working overtime to decouple them for months. I want to be wrong. And um, fighting for communities like ours is not easy. And um, it's never popular. You know, we look at courageous people and we look at community advocates in retrospect. Uh, in a positive way. But virtually everybody who was a community organizer in the moment was widely and broadly disliked. Everyone, Martin Luther King, Shirley Chisholm, Malcolm X, everybody. I mean, people like talk about MLK, even Republicans talk about MLK now. MLK was broadly unpopular in the United States of America. So was John F. Kennedy, by the way like broadly unpopular. And sometimes, you know, it's it's not an easy thing. And there's a lot of folks out there and um, they'll say, I'm gonna work really hard to defeat you and you're wrong and this, that, and the other. You know, if, if I wanted to do the safe thing, I would have done the safe thing. If I wanted to do the popular thing, I would make my decisions on the popular thing. And, um, you know, I'm willing and, you know, I was willing on Biff almost the, I was walking along trying to make this thing work the entire time. And um, to have these promises broken and this stuff shaken at the last minute, I'm really concerned. And um, part of me does think that the Build Back Better Act in some form or another will be passed. Will it be recognizable uh, from what it was on Monday? I'm not sure. And it was already cut down to four weeks of paid leave. It was already cut down to, um, you know, a lot, but there were still, there's still so much in there worth fighting for a civilian climate corps that hires over a quarter million people, Univer the establishment of universal pre-K in the United States of America. Uh, even though it's not universal, huge, huge, huge gains in uh, free and accessible childcare 
for working class people. This is what's in the Build Back Better Act. And um, I really hope we pass it. And I hope that we're wrong. I hope that I'm wrong. I really do. Um, and I hope that we vote on it in two weeks and it's just like what it was on Monday, if not better. Uh, but I just did not feel like I had the assurances in that moment to, inc to vote to increase U.S. climate emissions for an IOU. And people will argue that it doesn't increase them. But again, I want to give you all like behind the scenes, behind the scenes up to this point, I have been asking for the emission score on BIF, an official emission score. And I know that it's possible because we're always doing a mission score as we draft um, the Build Back Better Act and they're getting updated all the time. And I ask for emission scores on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And people were saying, oh, we can't give you that. And I feel like it, if it's not being given to me, it's because it's not good is how I was feeling. And you dig into these provisions, it's like, oh, there's, you know, we have investments in hydrogen energy. There's different kinds of hydrogen energy. There's, there's blue, there's gray, and there's green. Blue hydrogen energy, you gotta get that hydrogen from somewhere, you know where it comes from? Natural gas, fracking. Green energy sources are, like there's water sources involved. And so, you know, again, I'm not saying that I'm not, I'm not here to get on a high horse and say that this was bad and say that anyone who voted to proceed this was wrong or any of that. But I think we need to be willing to have folks who will hold these institutions accountable. And one of the issues that I think some of us have is that we, we represent communities that are left behind all the time, all the time. There are remarkable investments in, there, there are good investments in this infrastructure package. This, these decisions are not easy. Um, and you will see lists, X billion for this, X billion for that, like X billion for EVs, X billion for this, but the, but the devil's in the details. And the headlines are, are very important. I'm not even gonna say they're not important because in politics, you need narrative, you need momentum, you need to measure all of these things. And this was a very badly needed victory for the president. And again, I commend him from going to uh, getting it. But, um, but you want like, I could break things down for you all. Uh, we have $15 billion and what was passed last night? $15 billion in lead pipes. That's really great, right? So we can get lead out of water. How much money does it take to actually replace all the lead pipes in the United States of America? It costs about a minimum of $45 billion. So last night it funded 15. People would say, oh, like, that's great. Like, just take what you can get, right? So what do you do with $15 billion without any uh, guarantee that you're gonna get the other 35 to finish the job? You have two choices. You choose to either do a little bit of progress for everybody or you choose to fix it for some communities and not fix it for others. And so if you were going to go the route of we're going to do a little bit for everybody, 15 billion gets you, for example, about enough to identify all of the lead pipes in this country, but not really enough to replace all of them or it gets you again enough to fully replace some of them and not others. Our communities are always the ones that get chosen not to get these things. Um, and so we need this linkage, the EV investment, for example. I'm, I'm supportive of the construction of half a million EV chargers, which was in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. But we need the cars who will use the EV, <laughs> EV uh, stations. The, we need the electric cars to use that. And so the actual EVs, um, and 
you know, I want to hear like public transit, etc. aside, like EVs are not the, the entire transit solution, but the EVs themselves are in build back better. And so that's one of the reasons why we were like, both of these things need to go together. So, um, you know, again, you may disagree, you may think I'm awful, you may think I'm the worst, you may think, you know, uh, you hope that I'm gone. Um, and what happens happens. But I want you all to know that I got into this to put my community first. And I made a promise to put my judgment of what was best for our communities ahead of my own personal career every single time. And you may disagree. If you get your opinions from major media outlets, you probably don't agree with what I said and what and what happened. Um, but if you're from my district and if you're from my community, I want you to know that you were heard um, and that I answered your calls. And before this vote, the Working Families Party said, don't do this. Sierra Club said, don't do this. The Center for Popular Democracy said, don't do this. Uh, the Movement for Black Lives said, don't do this. And our, our, you know, our, our immigration advocates say, do not do this. And at the end of the day, if I have to choose between my political image or whatever and staying true to my community and doing what my community asks, I'm going to do what my district asks of me every time. Every time. Because I've already accomplished more than I ever dreamed. And so the rest of my life, is in repaying that debt to you all. So I would just wanna thank you. And again, if you disagree, that's fine. I'm gonna pop up. I'm gonna see, um, I'm gonna look at the questions that you have. I'm happy to answer any of the little technical questions because I think so much of what happens like behind the scenes is really important. For example, we were in caucus meetings yesterday. You go in, you check your phone, you go into a room, the door is closed, and you get no information from the outside. You don't know what your community is saying. You don't, you're not getting updates throughout the day. You're not getting calls. You are separated from your staff, and you have to make a decision completely siloed and you are literally by yourself. Um, and so, you know, I'm, so I'm here to answer some of your questions. Um, I just wanted to open that up. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm, I just want you all to feel like whether you agree with any individual decision or disagree with any individual decision, I want you to know that I make these decisions in the spirit of full accountability to you and to our community. And that for me, since the day I was elected, I have not taken one meeting with a corporate lobbyist, not one. The CEOs of the biggest banks in the world have asked for meetings with me and have asked to sit down with me in, in an office before major legislation that they have vested interests in or major hearings that they are about to appear in uh, are about to happen. And I say no every time, every single time. I literal billionaires, <laughs> I say no. Um, and so whether you agree with me, whether you disagree with me with this or that or whatever, I just want you to know that these decisions are made with, with the input of my community. And that's what comes first. So anyways, I'm gonna um, take your questions, happy to take your questions. You can pop them in the Q&A. 
Um, you can you can pop them here in the chat, but I'm gonna look it up. But if you have any questions about the process and all this other stuff, I'm happy to take a look at them. Um, first one, uh, can you save this live, please? Sure, I will save this live <laughs> afterwards. Um, let's see. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, do you think the Build Back Better Act will pass now? This is my concern. This was my concern. I'm not sure. And so, but here's the thing, like I'm before people like go off and be like, oh man, like the progressive caucus, like sold out, like all this other stuff. I want you to know it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. It's not, it's like not that simple. Um, the deal is, is like you have, there were Republican votes lined up to pass this. Uh, if it was, it was like they had the margins here and what Republicans, and by the way, the advantage of some of us saying no um, out, of, out of our principles and some of our communities saying no was that it forced a lot of Republicans to vote for this bill when they didn't want to because they wanted to turn this bipartisan bill that they had vested interests into into a partisan bill so that they could have their cake and eat it too, so that they could get their little oil and gas giveaways and then not vote for it and then trash it and say, this is on Biden and this is on all Democrats and this is all this stuff so that they could run against it. I mean, seriously. So for us, with our communities pushing no, it forced Republicans who secretly wanted it to pass but didn't want to vote for it, it forced them to show their hands and actually vote for it. Because the way that these things work is that I think a misperception about Congress is that votes come up and you just vote for a bill, like you only vote on bills, which by the way, like this is not something, if you don't know this, it's not that you don't, it's not that you're uneducated or ignorant or anything like this. It's like the same way that we all have our jobs. Like I, I don't have, a, 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 a driver's license to drive buses. Like there's all these little details, right? Like all these little details with our jobs. When you vote on the floor of Congress, you're not just voting on laws. You're voting on these little procedural things. And those little procedural moves are like these little chess games because you don't just bring a bill to the floor of the house, for example. You need to vote on the process to allow it to advance. And then you, you get to the point of the final passage, the vote of the final passage. So what does it have to do with Build Back Better Act? We have the rule, we have all of these things. And what was happening was that we wanted to hold these two votes together. And throughout all this process with the chess, there were folks trying to like get the, the uh, bipartisan bill procedurally to be like two steps ahead of this one and then we would be stubborn and then get this one two steps ahead and going like this and going like that and we were essentially at one point like this so will the build back better act pass now well now we're at the point where the bipartisan bill is now signed into law um, it was going to be signed into into law and as i was saying pramila jayapos and and the entire cpc the question is they had the republican votes it's going to be signed into law the question is, were if they iced out, if they got enough Republicans to pass it without any progressive votes, then they could really allow the Build Back Better Act to die. They could really allow it to just be completely gutted. Because some of the progressive caucus has skin in the game, much of the progressive caucus has skin in the game, um, there was a huge, I mean, this was a big political concession and now that creates a lot of political pressure on all sides to deliver on the Build Back Better Act. So I'm not gonna say no, because I'll be honest, there are, there's a lot of incentive on the line for the Build Back Better Act to pass. Where I'm really concerned is what it's gonna look like. Because as we've seen, it's been cut and cut and cut and cut and cut and cut and cut. And it's already like, 
so stripped down, but there are still like huge landmark investments in this. But if it gets cut down like a ton further, especially on climate, especially on climate, if we do not deliver the Build Back Better Act on climate, we will have done virtually nothing. The most optimistic scores on the bipartisan infrastructure plan alone has virtually no change in U.S. climate emissions. And I would argue that that is highly optimistic. And what we are seeing is just, we're not going to see a reduction. And that is locking in a future for us. And I mean, I'm the, I'm the youngest member of the Democratic caucus. Um, and I think my colleagues, like, I, I believe my colleagues respect uh, my concern on this because some of us are actually gonna live in 2050. And when I'm my colleagues age, I don't want our country to be in perpetual disaster. So um, I think that this moment puts a lot of pressure uh, because the president gave his word, speaker gave her word, you know, we've got the Senate, that this thing is going to happen. And um, I really hope that they deliver on that promise. So do I think it will pass? Uh, I believe that there are some sweeteners, there's, there's enough sweeteners for the wealthy in the Build Back Better Act act to continue to incentivize some of the most conservative Democrats to want something passed. I just really hope that the things for working people aren't gutted from it in the process. And I hope that our climate and that uh, our emissions targets aren't gutted in the process because this is our one shot. This is our one shot. And um, I think it's really important. So we'll see. What else? Um, Taking a look at some of the other questions you guys have. Do, do, do. Um, someone said, okay, why did free college, paid family leave, and Medicare drug pricing get cut from the BBB? These are issues. So here's the thing, right? Some of the same folks who are, well, opposition to paid leave is in the Senate. That's Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin does not believe that all people should have paid family leave in the United States. Um, that's a whole other conversation. But when we talk about um, tuition-free public colleges, when we talk about Medicare drug pricing, even overall prescription drug pricing, why those things were initially cut, some of the same characters that all of a sudden, we have about six Democrats that, um, that refused to support the bill, that all of a sudden said, out of like almost nowhere, we, oh, now we need a CBO score. Um, so we can't vote on this today. When we were literally ready to vote on both. I was gonna, I did, I did not, I don't love the bipartisan infrastructure plan because of my concerns on climate, but because one is paired with Build Back Better, I do believe that it that it leads to net reductions. Um, and you know, I can't just write whatever bill I want and pass it. This is a democracy. You do need to get votes from people you disagree with. Um, you know, we have all of this going on. So, anyways, all of this is to say is that some of these same six people, we have six people um, that all of a sudden said, we can't vote for this now. We were prepared to vote for it Monday. On Monday, I was gonna vote for Biff and the BBB. I was like, I didn't love it. I don't like it. But structurally, sometimes the pieces are where they are. And, um, and I was prepared and I was ready and I was open to considering that concession. So ready to go yes on both. 
Now, all of a sudden, yesterday and in the last like 24 to 36 hours, the same six people that have contributed the, to the cuts to prescription drug pricing, to tuition-free public colleges, to all of these things, are now saying we can't vote on any of this today. And so um, that's why it was cut. It was cut because there was a New York Democrat that sits on the Energy and Commerce Committee who voted to strip making prescription drug prices cheaper um, in her committee. She cast one, the deciding vote. Now there was um, a last minute compromise, even to salvage it, there was a last minute compromise made as, as recently as a couple of days ago to try to get something in there um, not even the big thing that helps people, but something in there. Um, and that still led to a holdout. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm highly concerned. I'm very concerned. Um, and I do believe that we need to deliver. We need to deliver. Um, someone said, who are the six? There was a statement. They released a statement yesterday. Um, so we have like, for example, representatives Kathleen Rice, Stephanie Murphy, um, I'm trying to remember, if you Google moderate statement <laughs> on Build Back Better yesterday, they, they have publicly listed their names uh, appended to it. And it's the statement where they're like, we promise contingent on a CBO score, etc." They put their names on top of it. So I'm not even like super narking on every, anybody or anything like that. Like they put their names on it. Um, but uh, Google it. Um, let's see. I'm taking a look at uh, some of the other questions you guys are sending. Um, someone said, what is the timeline for the BBB vote now? Here is the ostensible timeline. Here's another reason too, why I wanted to make sure for our, for our immigrant uh, families and advocacy groups, Here's the actual problem sometimes. So here's, sorry, I'm like, again, like I said, there's so much here. I'm like, what do I, how do I even frame this? How do I even start this? Um, so here's the agreement last night. Uh, the agreement was we would vote, there would be a vote or rather uh, the overall progressive caucus. Um, you know, there were a lot of folks that were like, okay, I'll agree to advance the BIF uh, if, um, if we get a commitment from some of these holdout moderates to vote on the Build Back Better Act the week of November 15th, so about two weeks from now. Now, their whole holdout was like, we need a CBO score. We need like a CBO score. What is a CBO score? I, I just saw that in there. Uh, these are people that are saying, oh, we need a score from the Congressional Budget Office before we vote on this bill. I can tell you 10 reasons why that is a hypocritical and suspect thing. I'm gonna be completely honest. First of all, it's hypocritical for them to suddenly conjure up this demand because they forced a vote on a bipartisan infrastructure bill yesterday that is not fully paid for and increases the, you know, and increases the US deficit, uh, which, you know, to me, that is not the, the highest priority issue, but for people that are saying we can't pass the Build Back Better Act if in case it increases deficit or we need to see it, for them to insist on it, it's like there's something weird going on. This is suspect. Um, and so the, the, either way, they insisted on it. They said that we need this. And by the way, who issues, who issues a CBO score? It is the Congressional Budget Office. Who's in charge of the Congressional Budget Office? A Republican. So you have conservative Democrats that have gutted pres prescription drug pricing, that have been working against tuition-free public colleges and tuition-free community college, that have been working against paid family leave and all this stuff, and they're all working and collaborating together. They've worked with Republicans to get the oil and gas provisions that they need in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And again, there are good things in the infrastructure bill. I'm not here to say that this was a bad thing, but I'm trying to assess all of this 
are now saying all of a sudden out of nowhere, because this was not a consistent demand for months on end, uh, was that they're saying, oh, now we need a CBO score. And if this score is out of step with what the White House has been projecting, then we're not going to commit on voting for this. And who is the head? Who is in charge of delivering that score? Who is in charge of that agency to deliver that score? A Republican. Who, by the way, earlier this year, misscored the budget impact of a $15 minimum wage. Remember earlier this year when folks voted against a $15 minimum wage, when Democrats voted against uh, proceeding on that? And so I'm concerned. There's a lot, that's a hole in here. But they committed, they said, if these numbers line up, which the CBO is notoriously inconsistent, notoriously gives out weird numbers that then have to be corrected like months down the line, all of these things. They say, if these scores line up, huge if, we will vote the week of November 15th. If they don't line up, then we're gonna have to think about it and try to work it out. And so, uh, you know, like I said, for communities where what is felt is virtually everything in the Build Back Better Act, we need someone who's willing to go, we need folks that are willing to go on the record and say, this doesn't feel right. And we're gonna hold you accountable. And so frankly, these no votes really, really rack up the temperature on leadership to deliver on paid family leave, to deliver on relief for immigrant communities, to deliver on all of these things. And so what is the, so some folks may say, like if you're more moderate, you may say, oh, like, come on, like the 15th, that's fine, you'll be fine. Okay, the week of the 15th, you'll be fine. All right, sure. Let me tell you about why a two week delay, what is the structural difference between a two week delay? On the issue of immigration, which by the way, you may be from all sorts of different communities, right? And there are folks that are saying, that are poo-pooing me and they're saying this is terrible, you know, whatever. You likely do not come from a community that is representative of the one that I represent. That like the, the vast bulk, because for example, in my community, the number one issue that people mobilize around is immigration. It is the thing I get the most calls about. It's what I need to do the most casework on. I'm, last year, I was literally pulling people that were, that were on planes, set to be deported back to countries that they have never established a life in, getting them off of planes. Immigration is the number one issue in our district and in our community. What's happening with the Build Back Better Act is that there is a pending, there's a pending conclusion from the Senate parliamentarian on the issue of parole, on whether or not uh, parole with benefits, it, it, wording aside, whether that can be included in the Build Back Better Act. So the House is in a race against time because House conservatives and House House conservatives don't want to include any language in a House bill that they think the parliamentarian would advise against. So if we held the Build Back Better Act vote this week before the parliamentarian issued guidance, we could include more provisions that every, anything from as short as just authorizing work requirements uh, for undocumented people, all the way up through, you know, even trying a Hail Mary and opening a path to citizenship by updating the registry. And so by delaying this vote by two weeks, it's very likely that the parliamentarian could come down with her guidance within the next two weeks. And then especially if that CBO score doesn't line up, um, for those moderates and this process gets delayed even further and further and further, 
Right now, this parliamentarian has sided against immigrants, has decided against immigrants every step of the way. And so this two week process politically could cost us huge advancements for our immigrant community, for my community. Most people don't live in a community that is 50, 60, 70% immigrant. I do, I do represent that. And so, um, so these delays have real costs. They have real costs. And the argument on voting for the bipartisan infrastructure bill right now is that if we didn't, the enormous costs would be political. There would be costs in the press and in public narrative, which people may say, oh, that's BS, it's important. Mainstream media has an enormous grip over an enormous sway over public opinion. So it matters. Um, and, uh, you know, that there were costs in momentum and all of that if this didn't pass today. The costs of not passing the Build Back Better Act now could potentially be relief for our, for our immigrant families. In, an, in any way, like in just a broad spectrum of possibilities. So, you know, this is like, this is what this is about. This is what this is about. Um, but um, anyways, I just wanted again, uh, wanted to just share all of this with y'all. Um, if this was a juncture where you all said, said, you know what? I liked you till now, and now I really don't like you. Um, that's fine. My goal is not to be in agreement with everybody. My goal is to be, as long as I am entrusted uh, with this seat, my goal is to be as transparent uh, and as faithful to our community as humanly possible. Um, and uh, that, that is my goal. It always has been my goal. It will always be my goal. Because at the end of the day, like this stuff isn't forever. It's, it's transitory to me. Um, I am not committed to doing the same exact thing the same exact way till I die. <laughs> I'm just not. Um, I'm committed to opening the window of possibility and impact as much as I can. So um, that's what it is. And it's all about people's theories of change. And my theory of change is all about conditions because I don't believe in like this Superman theory of history where a great epic person comes along and changes everything. I think that, um, that those are often the result of conditions and the best things that we can do as people is contribute to conditions that eventually become so overwhelming that they yield change. And um, I, want, I want to create the condition uh, because there was a promise made to pass paid family leave. There was a promise made to, there were promises made on childcare and on climate. And, you know, for me, climate is extremely, personally, climate is extremely important because this is our chance. And some of us actually have to live on this planet in 50 years. Um, and historically, uh, on the issue of climate, the United States government has eaten its young. It's chosen fossil fuels over the future gradually every single time. And um, now we're coming to that juncture where it needs to stop and it needs to end. But, um, you know, I think we need to create conditions. And I think that our no votes, um, put us in a position to call out the promises. So like, there's a promise. There was a promise made for a vote in two weeks. There was a promise made for a vote in two weeks. And 
we will be really positioned to hold that promise to account, to make sure that that check is cashed. And it's not easy, it's not fun. I know this doesn't make me popular with people, with, with a lot of people. I know this, you know, I make decisions that I know will cause me to lose support. Um, and I do it because I'm trying to make sure that we keep the conditions and the windows open. I don't want us to sacrifice parents and the elderly and people who have to choose between insulin and rent. I don't want us to sacrifice those people. Um, and uh, sometimes you gotta take a little bit of blood and sometimes you gotta take, uh, you gotta, you know, take those hits in order to keep those windows open. So again, I really congratulate the president because what he did was extremely difficult. I really congratulate um, uh, Chairwoman Jayapal, who was put in a pretty impossible position. Uh, I congratulate the speaker for delivering 15, what 13, I believe, Republican votes uh, for President Biden's agenda. You know, whether you agree ideologically or not, this stuff is not easy. Um, and, uh, you know, there are going to be folks at any one juncture that think that are willing to throw me away due to any one decision. Like there'll be any one decision, any one day, any one vote where they will say, because of this one vote, I'm done with you, et cetera. And um, that's politics. It's not personal. That's politics. But the people that I'm most accountable to are the ones who don't consider me disposable, who don't consider me a disposable human being because I don't consider them disposable human beings. And I would never do that to somebody else. If you do that to me, that's fine. Because being in a position, you know, an elected seat, like you sign up for a lot of this stuff. Um, but, you know, so if that's what it is, that's what it is. And sometimes there are moments to, um, Sometimes there are moments where you're willing to just give it all up for what you think is right. And the movement to enroll BIF yesterday without the Build Back Better Act does, does, is a gamble on, on the Build Back Better Act as it is, as it is. Um, and so again, I wanna be wrong. I really, really wanna be wrong. Please prove me wrong. Please pass, please prove me wrong and pass, pass universal childcare, prove me wrong and pass the emissions decreases, prove me wrong and, and protect the methane fees, prove me wrong and, uh, and, and don't expand tax breaks for billionaires Prove me wrong on all of it. If I lose my seat because I'm proven wrong and all of these things are protected and passed as is and we deliver for immigrant families and we deliver like worth it. I want to be so wrong about this. I want this whole act to be passed as is. And if that gets delivered and if that gets enrolled into law, awesome. Um, but from what was happening behind the scenes and from promises and assurances not even being able to be kept within two hours, it really shook my confidence on whether it could be kept within two weeks. And so um, someone needs to be there to hold it accountable. And um, and so much of this is about trust. And I'm not sitting here to say, I don't trust our leadership, but I need to preserve the trust of my community. And if this doesn't happen, I think the thing that, you know, folks like in politics, if you think about politics as like a universe, 
The wealthy, the privileged, and the power are the sun around which all of our political institutions revolve around. It's the issues that the, that the wealthy, the affluent, um, and the privileged care about are by and large what mass media covers. It's what Congress circulates around, all this other stuff. And communities like ours are Pluto. Um, and we're trying to just get a little bit uh, in with everybody else. So, you know, I really hope I'm wrong. And I think the best case scenario is that we get a pass, we get this whole thing passed in two weeks. And these folks that were just juggling all of these inconsistencies and switching it up and inventing these things and going back on their words suddenly keep their word. Um, but, you know, tying it to a CBO score and having that CBO and having the CBO being conveniently run by a Republican is concerning to me. And I don't think that we as legislators should be outsourcing our decisions, uh, whether it's on the parliamentarian or anything else. And so, um, and if they don't deliver, I think if this process drags on, if it doesn't pass before the end of the year, if this gets just gummed up and sludged up and trimmed down and all this other stuff, then that really increases the pressure on the president to deliver on his executive authority in a lot of ways. You all can name them. So the stakes are even higher now than they were 48 hours ago. That's what I would say for everybody involved. The stakes are higher for us, the stakes are higher on leadership because you know a lot of promises were made. And if those promises aren't kept, it's going to be a lot more difficult to, um, to make any more promises after that. And so I really hope that these promises are kept, not just for any you know, petty political purpose, but because of people's lives. So um, thankful to you all. Uh, I don't know if anyone else, like, take from it what you may. I'm sure people are spinning it and uh, saying, you know, whatever. I'm sure corporate interests and all this other stuff are ready to just chop this up and spin it however they're going to spin it. And I can't, uh, you know, to a certain extent, there's nothing I can do about that. But what I can do is just give it to you all straight and lay it all out, all out here transparently and um, think about what you would do given that incomplete uh, information, given all of those strings of broken promises and very little time. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not saying that this outcome was bad. Um, I'm, I'm not disparaging the many people who contributed to this process. Uh, but I think we all need to have, you know, we have a diverse caucus and we need to position ourselves in the positions of our communities to represent that landscape in Congress um, and to deliver 100% uh, of an entire caucus, including communities that are historically underserved without guarantees for serving those communities is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but um, that's what it is. So uh, if you're wondering, if you're just hopping on, you can just rewind to the beginning, but um, just care about you all. And let's all pray that the Build Back Better Act passes in two weeks. Because if it doesn't, we're in trouble. Okay, that's just what it is. I'm just, I'm just being keeping it 100 with you all. The Build Back Better Act is not passed in two weeks. We're in trouble. We're in big trouble. Um, we're in trouble politically. We're in trouble policy wise. We're in trouble with impact. We're in trouble with all of it. Because people want to freak out about election results. This is this is the ultimate impasse that we get at that that we're at as a party is that people think 
that the base, the things you need to do to win over the base and the things, or rather to turn out your base and the things that you need to do to win over swing voters are in direct opposition and one must have like just supremacy over the other. And oftentimes it's the moderate position that gets, that has supremacy over the progressive position, um, which means don't talk about racial justice at all. Hey, Deco. Don't talk about racial justice at all. Don't talk about like any of that. Um, and uh, and what we saw, for example, in Virginia was an absolute cratering of the youth vote. And people are just conditioned like, oh, that's supposed to happen. Like that happens every time. It, do it doesn't always have to happen. Um, and we need to figure out a way to bring both of these forward together without just telling underserved communities, well, it's your fault if you don't turn out high enough when there isn't, when, you, when your needs aren't being heard. So, you know, we've got to figure out a path um, and I hope that we can figure that out together. Um, I'm, I'm not here to go after anyone in my party. Um, certainly there may be some that go after me, but this was a very difficult impasse. Um, and I'm, I'm praying for all of us, y'all. <laughs> all right, that's enough. Bye-bye.